This video is going to take us through the phylum Chordata. Most of this phylum is going to include vertebrate animals, but there are two subphyla that are invertebrate, and tunicates is the first one of those two groups. Same notes as last time, so CO is common organisms. These guys are usually called sea squirts. And then char is characteristics. So these are the characteristics that this group has. They already have all the characteristics that chordates have. These are the special characteristics that tunicates have that are special and different from the rest of the phylum chordata, essentially. Um, tunicates or sea squirts are another one of those organisms that you're not going to have encountered if you've been in this part of Texas your whole life. Um, if my video wants to work, we'll see if I can't show you what some living sea squirts look like. So this one's actually very different from a normal one. They found this way deep down in the ocean. Um, it is predatory, like the name suggests, over off to the side. They are not usually this big, and usually tunicates are filter feeders, but this guy has modified this big old mouth to try to catch food and then eat things that have gone into his mouth. Um, again, ordinarily these guys are a lot smaller than that, but that one was interesting, so I just figured I'd show you what he looks like. Or she, I don't know what her life's like or his life is like. Next up we have lancelets. Mm. Lancelets are sort of like really super primitive fish. They are not fish, they do not have vertebrae. Real fish are in the subphylum vertebrata, um, but these guys live in the water and probably if you were to find one you would think it was like a little minnow or something. They don't have eyes, um, they don't get the true vertebrae, they stay as a notochord. Um, and so this is, it. they have all those same features, the dorsal hollow nerve tube, the pharyngeal gill slits, the post-anal tail, they keep those even into adulthood. So these guys are fairly small. They will very often bury themselves in the sand so that other larger things won't eat them. From there, we get into the subphylum that we belong to. So everything from here on out is gonna be in the subphylum vertebrata. So we are technically vertebrates at this point. This is one of the more primitive vertebrates. Their skeleton is cartilage. Um, but even with that, it does have vertebrae, and so again, it is a vertebrate. What's weird slash special about hagfish, because their cartilage is skeleton, they're very flexible. These fish can literally tie themselves into knots. They will eat whales that fell down after they died at the bottom of the ocean and then just tear fleshy bits off of the whale. Um, because they're not super advanced, they are also prey items for other things, and so one of the things that they will do to deter predation is produce all of this really gross slime. Because let's face it, do you want to eat something that is just coated in this really viscous slime? Um, they make that by producing this protein and then releasing it into the water, and then when it mixes with water, it just, it just produces copious amounts of slime. Protect itself. And you can see now why we needed such a big tank. Apparently just one of these fish can make enough slime to fill a bucket of water in seconds. So they, they produce a lot of this stuff just to make sure they don't get eaten by something else. I mean, it would put me off, to be fair. I'm not hungry. This is a lot of slime in here now. Oh... Now this might look pretty disgusting, and to be fair, in fact, it is. But there's good reason why we're doing this, not just have a laugh at my expense, because it's, it's about the slime, and it's about what the slime is actually capable of. It's probably time I got out now. Yeah. Let's get me out of here. It's, oh, oh, this is not at all pleasant. It's not nice. However... This stuff, disgusting as it is, is quite fascinating. I know it doesn't look much like spider silk, or feel like it. Oh! But that's because I haven't finished with it yet. To turn this into something that can compete with spider silk, I need to put it on my special hagfish slime hanger. That'll dry it out, and then eventually they can weave that into fibers, and so that's what they were doing there. Um, next up we get jawless fish. So um, these guys are starting to get a skeleton that's a little bit more advanced. It's still a lot of cartilage, but there does get to be some bone in parts of it. While they do have a jaw, their jaw cannot open and close, so that's why they're considered to be jawless fish. Um, a lot of these guys work like leeches, and what they'll do is attach to a larger fish and then scrape tissue off of that larger fish, and so they're parasites. So this just shows you the mouth of um, a lamprey. 
which they're sometimes called lamprey eels. So this is a paddlefish. I want to say I showed you this video in lab two, but there's the lamprey that's attached to the paddlefish. All right. Next up, cartilaginous fish. So the top predator in the ocean, depending on who you believe, most people think it's a great white shark. It belongs in this group too. Um, I personally don't believe great whites are the top predator because orcas will eat great white sharks. So I think an orca or a killer whale is the top predator, but whatever, we won't argue so much about that. Uh, this is the largest fish in the ocean. It's a whale shark. It belongs in this group. Um, I've got a little video to show you. If I remember right, this is one that I took while I was at the Atlanta Aquarium. I was enjoying this manta ray that was swimming through a scuba diver's bubbles. And I wasn't really paying attention to what was going on over here until it became very obvious that I should have been paying attention to what was off over there as this giant whale shark came swimming into view. Um, Atlanta, I, I haven't been to a lot of aquariums. I've been to one in San Francisco, one in New Orleans, and then the Atlanta one. And I have to say, I think the Atlanta one had the best aquarium. Uh, maybe just for the fact that they had the whale sharks. They had a tank that was big enough that there were multiple whale sharks in that tank. And they're just so graceful to watch swimming through the water. They aren't predators of people. They're filter feeders, kind of like baleen whales are, but they're cartilaginous fish. Um, so one of the things that was mentioned on that previous slide was that fish, not just cartilaginous fish, a lot of fish, they have this structure that runs down the side that's called a lateral line. That lateral line can detect waves in, in the water, under the water, and so they can tell when there's something splashing around nearby that they might want to go eat. Or if they're a prey item, there might be a predator nearby, and so it can tell them about that. So it's a sense organ that tells them if there's something splashing around on one side or another. Uh, next up we get to bony fish. This was the class Osteichthys based on lab. Um, so these are some of the ones that you could find if you were swimming out in the ocean. This is a flounder, uh, puffer fish of course, and then seahorse up over here. They're all in this group. These guys do have lateral lines just like the cartilaginous fish do. Um, more than likely you have eaten a bony fish at some point in your life, whether it was salmon or tuna or catfish or uh, bass or flounder or whatever. Um, so that's why I gave you that miscellaneous thing. There are a lot of people who rely on fish as one of their main sources of protein, so they are important for us on the food web. There's a few different kinds of fish. So ray finned fish, they're called that because I don't know if you've ever played around with a fish or caught a fish for yourself, but if you play around with their fins, there are these little they almost feel like little spikes that are in there. They're called rays. So ray finned fish are the fish that you're familiar with, like this trout or again, bass, catfish, whatever. The other option here, oh, did I have a video? I guess I had a video. Wasn't even paying attention to that. Let's see what this one is. This is just a super awesome fish. I love the way it looks. It's another one that they found with a submersible deep in the ocean. And it has, like it says, tubular eyes where the eyes start out here and they come all the way back. That is, we believe they're lens or I believe they're lens. And so they have a very long eye. Just a chill fish swimming around at the bottom. But at some point, I think you can see when they get closer to the fins that the fins do have rays in them. And so this is a ray finned fish. Yeah, you can kind of see them back there on that tail fin. So ray finned fish. The other option for fins is to have bony appendages um, called lobes. You can kind of see them. Um, these are not super common fish. In fact, we thought these fish were extinct until the 1970s because all we had found them on was fossil records. But they've got this little bony appendage that allows them to walk on the bottom of the ocean. And so these are lobe fin fish. Next up, we get to amphibians. So amphibians means two lives. They have a life on land and a life in water. They must reproduce in water because they don't have an amniotic egg. Uh, this guy lives in the rainforest where it's wet enough that it can actually brood its tadpoles on its back. That's what that is. That's one of its tadpole babies. Um, remember the rule, the brighter colored it is, the more you should not touch it. A lot of frogs and toads can secrete poisons outside of their body. So if you just so much as touch them, they can kill you in some cases, especially these special frogs that are called dart frogs. Um, I want to say this is just a silly video. Let's see. Yeah, <laughs> dude tries to make this super duper dramatic. I'm going to skip past a lot of this jazz and go to right here. Okay, maybe I should have skipped more. So 
This was an amphibian that was jumping to get away from a reptile. I like this video because even though they have these stick little arms, you can see how strong they are. Like, watch this little dude. He does a full-on pull-up. I can't do pull-ups, so I'm impressed that the frog can. Um, I don't know how many of you guys dissected frogs back in high school or anything, but frogs have this wonderful little six-pack. They've got some abs going on underneath their skin, so frogs are a lot stronger than we might give them credit for. Um, this is something that I think I'm... Oh, we don't do fungus in this school, so never mind. We didn't talk about it, but there is a fungus called a chytrid fungus, and chytrid fungus has been introduced into a lot of places where frogs live, and what it does is it gets into their skin. Now, frogs do have lungs, but they're not very well developed, and so a lot of the respiration that a frog does actually happens through their skin. So when they get that fungus into their skin, they can't breathe anymore, and then as a result, they end up dying. And so a lot of species of frogs have been wiped out because of this fungus, and there are a bunch more that are on the endangered species list, and that fungus is a big chunk of the reason why. Um, the other thing that I want to mention, um, if you can see an eardrum on the outside like you can really well on this frog, that it's, it tends to mean it's not a frog, it's a toad. Um, around in our area, we do have a fair amount of toads, and one of the things that can happen if you have a dog that can be scary is your dog might try to eat the toad and then start foaming at the mouth and look rabid. That's because the toad produces a toxin. Um, after a while, your dog's going to stop foaming. They usually don't even necessarily need vet care, although if you're at all worried, by all means, take your dog to the vet. But that teaches your dog, don't eat frogs. Bad things will happen to you if you try to eat frogs or toads. Mm. Next up, we get the reptiles. So your common organisms and then your characteristics are off down here. One of the special things that I want to mention about this is um, reptiles are capable of several different forms of laying eggs. Um, this guy right here is what's known as oviparous, or actually this girl right here is what's known as oviparous, which means she lays eggs. They'll build a nest, they'll lay their eggs in it. Sometimes they dig a nest, it depends on the species how they do that. But some reptiles actually, they still make an egg that has a shell around it, but then they keep the eggs inside of them. And so they're what's known as ovoviviparous because they make eggs, but then it looks like they give live birth because the eggs actually hatch inside of mom. Some of the reptiles that we have in our area, um, like rattlesnakes, they're the ovoviviparous. They don't lay their eggs. Instead, the eggs hatch out so it looks like the snake is giving birth to live young, although that's not really how that worked out. Oh, darn. I really should check these before I try to play them for you guys, but let's see. Miscellaneous stuff. Here in our part of Texas, you can find coral snakes, which is this guy off over here. Um, stupid memory trick to help you remember is uh, red on yellow kill a fellow, red on black friend of Jack. So this is a mimic. It is not actually venomous and it can't hurt you. It tries to look like this guy so that you will leave it alone because this guy is a venomous species of snake. It happens to be the only one in uh, Texas that produces a neurotoxin that affects the nervous system. The other ones produce cytotoxins. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions out there about rattlesnakes and copperheads. In my experience, they are not aggressive. As long as you don't mess with them, they won't mess with you. Water moccasins are different though. They will mess with you just because they're bored that day. And so if you're in the water and there's a snake coming towards you, probably a good idea to get away from that water. Uh, one of the other special things that goes along with reptiles is you remember as we were talking in the reproductive system, our chromosomes determine what sex we're going to be. If we're XX, we're female. If we're XY, we're male. doesn't work that way in crocodilians. Instead, the temperature that the eggs are incubated at determines the sex that the babies are going to be when they come out. And as a general rule, the higher the temperature, the more females will actually be born. Um, that can be problematic with climate change because if there's no males around, the females can't get pregnant. Although reptiles, there are a lot of species of reptiles that can also do something called parthenogenesis, where it's like a virgin birth. They never mate, they never had sex, and yet somehow they have a baby. That has been observed in Komodo dragons, a lot of snakes, and a fair number of lizards as well. So they do some weird things, the reptiles, sometimes. Um, let's see, I've got a video for crocodiles, I think. Let's see what this one's about. Oh, I'm so glad I had it muted, because I cannot stand this stupid gecko that I can't skip. This is why I hate it, it's because I can't skip it. Crocodile. 
now seem to spend their entire lives with every sense turned towards the hunt. Africa. Crocs are hatching. The gender of each is determined by the heat in the nest. If the egg stays between 88 and 90 degrees, it produces a male. Higher or lower, and it produces a female. Now they're vulnerable. A quick snack for hungry predators. But this is their mother, and she's not eating them. She's protecting them. To gently pick up her babies, she uses the deadliest jaws on the planet. They're capable of delivering a bite force of 5,000 pounds per square inch, which makes them more than seven times more powerful than a great white shark's bite. This mother carries a mouthful to safer waters. I'm going to pause for just a second. I hope that you're going to hear this, but I want you to listen to the sound that little baby crocodiles and alligators, for that matter, make. Even then, she has to stand guard. Only 1% of newborns make it to adulthood. This youngster's instinct to kill is there almost from day one. As it grows bigger, it moves its way up the food chain. Feathered, furred, or otherwise, all that matters to the croc is that it's edible. Darn. I didn't play the sound anymore. Hopefully you heard it as it was going. That's a sound that can really make your blood run cold when they do their little chirps. Because what they're doing is they're calling for mom. So I just kind of want you to hear it. Okay, this one just has me curious. So that's their little sounds. They're kind of adorable. And yet that sound is wholly terrifying when you hear it out in the wild. Because if you hear it, yeah, it's just little babies making that sound. But they're calling their mom who is nearby. And so it means... Basically, get away from me or my mom's going to come over here and tell you what's up. All right. Next up, we get to the birds. You're, you know what birds are. You've seen birds. This one is an emu off over here. Let's come see what video I have linked to for this bird. Okay. This one is to show you that birds can be very intelligent. There are some of them are, that are capable of problem solving. I'm going to silence this one. Um, but I'm sure at some point you guys have met a kid that is unable to solve this puzzle and they end up like throwing pieces across the room because they can't do it. And I want you to just notice that this bird does not have any problems figuring out where those pieces are supposed to go. So birds are very intelligent animals. It does, oh, not that one. It struggles with this next one, I believe. But even that one, it gets towards the end. It just puts it away for just a second because it couldn't get it in and then decides to play with the triangle here in just a second. African greys are considered to be some of the most intelligent birds. Crows and magpies are capable of very advanced problem solving. And so one of the things you need to know is if you decide that you want to get a bird as a pet, you need to know that you have to entertain them. If you don't, they will do destructive behaviors like they will pluck their own feathers out of their body. Um, they get a little endorphin rush when they do that and that's not good for them overall. And so you got to make sure you're keeping them entertained. Y'all have all had a feather in your hand at some point in your life, more than likely. Um, so not only does it help them thermoregulate, they also provide lift for flight. Um, I already mentioned the intelligent thing right here. The other stuff I want to tell you, if you have outside cats, there have been numerous studies that have shown via putting cameras on cats that cats kill a lot of birds during the course of a day. Now, some birds can handle, you know, one or two deaths or something, but there are birds out there that are endangered, and some of them, outside cats, are part of the reason why they're on that endangered species list. Outside cats don't live as long as inside cats. They're more likely to get parasites. They're more likely to get run over by cars. They're more likely to get kidnapped by somebody else who thinks it's a good cat. So think long and hard when you get a cat about whether or not you want your cat to be able to go outside. 
Um, the other little blurb that I mentioned here is the elaborate mating rituals. There are usually some really impressive songs and dances that go along with birds. Here, this is going to show you, so a bowerbird, the male, ends up making this really elaborate display. It's not a nest. It's basically a dance floor for him to come on. Um, all bowerbirds have their own specific things that they like. This dude likes blue stuff, and so he goes out and he collects a bunch of blue things, and then he puts them in front of this bower, trying to make it as pretty as he can so that the lady will think he's a sexy, good provider, and she will sleep with him. If his bower is not elaborate enough, or it doesn't have enough blue stuff, or it doesn't look fancy enough, she won't go into the actual bower, which means he won't be able to have sex with her. So if she's ready, she enters that little door, and then she lays down, and he knows that she's ready for that game. She ends up deciding to not play around with him until he goes, and he literally steals money and car keys. He steals somebody's car keys, which he's got no use for car keys, and yet it works. I'm not sure at what point he goes to get the car keys. Yeah, she decided at the end. So there you go. Um, birds, they're weird, they're smart, they'll steal your stuff. Mm. Um, last up, we have mammals. So this is the main chunk that you need for them. This little guy is a tarsier, if you've never seen what they look like. Um, all mammals have mammary glands. Um, these are the most primitive of the mammals. They do have mammary glands. They don't have nipples, though. Their milk just kind of oozes out, and the babies lap it off of their fur. This is a duck-billed platypus with its babies that have just hatched. And this is echidna, just if you've never seen what an echidna looks like. It's essentially an egg-laying porcupine, and so that's its guy. Um, marsupials are the pouched animals, so most everybody is familiar with kangaroos. Sugar gliders are things that you can get as a pet around here. I don't recommend it, though. They smell really bad, especially if you get a male. And then this is a bandicoot. And then placental mammals, that's what you are, where you, the young stay in you and they are born at the end of gestation. This is actually the placenta that makes them a placental mammal. So that concludes the animal chapter. Stay tuned for what the assignment will be.